from down under, Mr. John Lane. Thank you very, very much, Father Anaya. I didn't tell him anything, so none of that's true. <laughs> Good evening to Reverend Clergy and uh, to our lovely sisters and ladies and gentlemen. It's a really strange experience to come to the other side of the world and meet people that you've been friends with for nine years that you've never met. And uh, that's happened several times this, this week. And it's a lovely thing. And it's almost like Divine Providence arranged the internet uh, for that time when the Catholic Church would be reduced to a remnant and even those that we kneel next to at the communion rail, we can hardly talk to sometimes because if we do, we won't want to kneel next to them anymore. It's surreal. The real reason that they invited me to speak to you was because they're very good at marketing here at the Mount and they wanted somebody that sounded like Steve Irwin. <laughs> and just to make sure that uh, I do sound like Steve Irwin, I should let you know that my wife and I, uh, I was informed by her this morning, have uh, number nine, an adopted creature, uh, which needs to be fed every four hours with a bottle. Um, no, it's not a koala. <laughs> they scratch. Uh, it's a kangaroo. We were travelling in the outback last year and we went to a little place called Payne's Find, which is a reference to a gold find by a fellow called Payne, I assume. Uh, either that or a reference to someone suffering in, in uh, thinking they'd found something. And uh, the, the lady that ran the, the gold battery uh, at Payne's Find uh, offered to get us a kangaroo if... Uh, if there was uh, one came available. Anyway, she's, she's gone out to shoot a, a roof for, for dog meat and uh, accidentally shot a mother. Which neatly brings us to G.K. Chesterton's comment on the theme of tonight's speech, I will be with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. In his book, The Everlasting Man, which everybody should read, in my opinion. He explains that the Catholic Church is, has been successful for all the wrong reasons. The Catholic Church has been successful despite herself. She's preaching a doctrine which is contrary to all of our inclinations, all of our desires, and yet she grows. She preaches that doctrine to men who are completely sensual, pagan Romans, and they accept it. They try, many of them, try to kill the church out by bloody persecution and they end up being defeated by her sweet passivity. And then he points out through history how many times the church looked like she must fail. And she must fail for many reasons. She must fail because men will get tired of this new thing. She must fail because she's preaching a doctrine that's contrary to our nature. She must fail because men find some other thing that they think is more interesting, even if they're not tired of the one they've got already. She must fail because science advances, the science of philosophy, the science of whatever. And he summarises it and he says, At least five times, therefore, with the Arian and the Albigensian, with the humanist sceptic, referring to the Renaissance, 
After Voltaire and after Darwin, the faith has, to all appearance, gone to the dogs. In each of these five cases, it was the dog that died. The dog of the Novus Ordo is going to die. It's only a question of time. At the end of St Matthew's Gospel, where we read these words, there's a little piece of text there that I don't know whether anybody else has noticed, but I'd never noticed it until I went to look this text up to see what I should be talking about. And verse 16 reads, And seeing him, so verse 16, And the eleven disciples went into Galilee, unto the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And he told them when he rose from the dead, Go into Galilee. He told them before he died, I will see you in Galilee after I rise from the dead. So they went into Galilee, unto the mountain where Jesus had appointed them, and seeing him they adored, but some doubted. And Jesus coming spoke to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Going therefore teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. And it seemed to me in reading that, that, and behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world, obviously is a reference to go and teach, I have all power, and I will assist you. And all the exegetes say that, as far as I've seen. But it also seems to me to be a recapitulation or a a bolstering of their faith. Some doubt it, even then. Some doubt it. So he reminds them that they won't have to believe in him from afar that they can believe in him with his assistance because he will be with them, with us, all days. And this is why when we discuss the difficulties of the current situation in the church, we are only discussing difficulties. There is no danger to faith in these things, if we remember what faith is and we have the correct attitude to faith, which is that when a difficulty suggests itself as a doubt, we make an act of faith. That's what God wants from us. So how is our Lord with us all days? He's with us in the church and he's with us individually in our souls. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of those. Many years ago, uh, 15 years ago I think, I was reading something and the suggestion was put, and it came from the fathers of the church, that the Catholic Church, the mystical body of Christ, lives the life of Christ in a mystical manner through history. And I was electrified by it. That is such a rich notion. The Catholic Church is the mystical body of Christ and in a very real sense is the incarnation extended through time. Christ lives in the Church. The Church is Christ in the language of the fathers. The whole Christ, as some of them say. And so Christ being the same yesterday, today and tomorrow, his life is always the same. And his life in contact with nature, the nature of the world, the nature of men, must always produce the same reaction in those men. Some of them will submit to him, like you, Mary Magdalene. Some of them will say, with Pontius Pilate, I'm indifferent. And some of them, like the Sanhedrin, will wish to 
crucify him. And the other aspect of this, we'll come back to that, is that the human race is a family. I was talking to the school children the other day and I tried to get them to, to see how the human race is an organic family by con- comparing and contrasting with the angels. The angels are all an individual species. Every angel is created by God uniquely. No angel begets another angel. But the human race all comes from Adam, as we all know. And therefore we have this organic unity that we were all in Adam. And modern science with the, the study of DNA has actually seen this more clearly perhaps than uh, it was ever seen before. And so we have a natural affinity with the concept of a drama, of a story, because we are a story. There was the creation and there's the last judgment. And in in between there's the great romance, the great drama of human history. And on a micro level, the same thing's true of every single one of us. And so Jesus Christ, the perfect man, who is our pattern who is incarnated precisely, at least one reason, was precisely to provide us with that pattern of perfect human life, is matched by Jesus Christ in his mystical body as a collective or as a family of men in the same way that an individual lives an individual human life And the human race lives this long historical life that began with Adam and will end with the second coming or with the last judgment. These are very rich ideas. Um, I can't draw out every aspect of them. But if we look at the... If we look at the life of Christ and we just look at the look at it in large chunks, we can see the, the infancy, the hidden life at Nazareth, the public life and glory of our Lord, the passion and death, and finally the resurrection and then the ascension. And so in the life of the church, we expect to see this same unfolding. And we see the infancy of the church, and just as Herod tried to kill our Lord Jesus Christ as a baby. The Roman emperors tried to kill the church and destroy it by bloodshed, the massacre of the innocents. And just as our Lord Jesus Christ lived a period where he was obscure and hidden, so the church, through the long dark night of the dark ages after the collapse of the Roman Empire, worked away in the monasteries, re-civilising the world, and creating a new civilization from the remnants of the old one. And then it grew in wisdom and holiness and appeared almost with a burst in the glory of the high Middle Ages. And then came the passion of the church, the mock trial of the Protestant revolt where the truth of Christ is taken to the bar and compared with human wisdom and found wanting and the passion of the church through time as the Protestant revolt led into the crowning with thorns of the French Revolution when our Lord Jesus Christ is stripped of his kingship and mocked as king And finally, the death and burial of the church at Vatican II. And so this very rich concept of the church mystically living the life of Christ through time brings us to where we are today, which is Holy Saturday for the church.